Well, you know, my speech is not actually going to be about me. It's going to be about us. And in fact, it's going to be about us on the broadest possible description of the word us. I mean, think about this image, which is now over 40 years old. And think about back then in 1968 when Apollo 8 astronaut took this picture. Imagine what that vision must have been like. Imagine yourself in a, in a steel capsule with a handheld camera coming around the moon and seeing that image for the first time. At the time, there were 3.8 billion people on the, in the world. Now there are 6.8 billion people in the world. And if you look at the distribution of people in this world that we now inhabit, you see in these red dots the, the very densely populated parts of the world. You see in China and in India and in Indonesia and in Japan very high densities of people. You see in the United States patches of high densities of people, but less than 5% of the world's population. If you consider the energy use over around the world, as indicated by the night sky image shown here, you realize that we, as less than 5% of the world's population, are using over 25% of the world's resources. Now, this isn't fundamentally bad. I'm not making a value judgment about this. But what it means is that if the people in China and India decide to live like us, and our media is doing a wonderful, a, a wonderful job of spreading the concept of our lifestyle around the world, if that population lives like us, we need five planet Earths to support our lifestyle globally. Now, if you look at the current use of energy, for most of the things we do, you notice here that we have coal at the bottom. Above that, we have nuclear. And this is actually from eight, 1980 all the way up to projected to 2030, 2035. And so what you see coal and nuclear and natural gas and liquids, which are all kinds of oil and fossil fuels. And there in that little green strip, that's biofuels. And above that is renewables, wind, solar, energy. And you see the predictions out into the future. There's a problem. This is what we call peak oil prediction. So this is what people now think is going to happen with our oil and all of our other natural products. This is billions of barrels a year plotted against time going out to 2050, and we are here. So we do not have an infinite supply of the, all of those natural products, those fossilized forms of sunlight in the form of natural gas and petroleum and coal, those are not infinite supplies. Now, it's true that if we work hard and we're incredibly ingenious, we can make systems that allow us to access some of this fossil energy in very difficult places. The consequences, unfortunately, are occasionally this goes wrong. And occasionally, we end up with a situation like we saw in the Gulf of Mexico, and we all remember the new horizon. Occasionally, we run into the difficulty of polluting our environment because of our needs for fossil forms of energy. Do we have a problem? If we have this, if we consider the graph I showed you here, and we look at the history, and we look at the projections out into the future, we can ask ourselves, would it be possible to change those renewable data and the biofuels data and expand, rather than doing 85% of all of our energy from fossil forms of fuel, can we use biofuels or other forms of renewable to use better than half of all of our energy needs? Would it be possible to envision a system where biofuels that are sustainable and renewable, can we make that have a, over half of what our energy needs might be? And avoid, at the same time, this type of unfortunate circumstance, which is a, sh a cartoon shown here. Excuse me, I'm going to need this corn cob to make ethanol to run my car. And while this is sort of, this is sort of taken as a cartoon, in reality, the problem is that 75 million people went into the category of 
undernourished because we started planting corn to make starch, to make ethanol, rather than to feed people, according to the United Nations Food and uh, Agriculture Organization. So what are the criteria that we need for biofuels? Well, the first thing will be that we can't compete with agriculture. We can't compete with agriculture partly because of what I just showed you, that we can, in the real time, we're going to start competing with, for, for food, but also we can't compete with agriculture because we have a prediction that the population of the world by the year 2050 is going to be on the order of 9 billion people by 2050. We can't compete for agri with agriculture for fresh water, and we can't compete for fertilizer, and we can't compete for land, and whatever we do has to be feasible, affordable, it has to be scalable, sustainable, and it has to happen now. It has to be done uh, with, with the technology that we have now because we don't have 20 years to figure out how to make this work. So let's look at some of the biofuels crops. In plotted here, you see gallons per acre per year of biodiesel production. Soybean produces about 50 gallons per acre per year. Sunflowers can produce on the order of 100 gallons per acre per year. Canola is 160. Jotropha, which is a bush that makes very oily seeds, produces on the order of 200 gallons per acre per year. Palm oil is on the order of 600 gallons per acre per year. We're doing pretty well. Palms, unfortunately, though, grow in tropical places and often islands in the South Pacific are now being completely stripped of their forests so we can plant palms. But look at this, microalgae. We've known for a long time that microalgae are incredibly good at producing oil. Between 2,000 and 5,000 gallons per acre per year. What are microalgae? Well, microalgae are single-celled organisms that have been on the planet for an incredibly long time. And in fact, they're responsible for most of the oil, most of the fossil oil that we now currently pull out of the bottom of the oceans, or even on land, which used to be under shallow seas in very early, early prehistoric times. So this doesn't give you a very good impression about what these organisms look like. So I, I'm now showing you a picture in which I'm going to throw a human hair into the image to give you a size scale. So that's how small these organisms are, and yet they're incredibly abundant. And their abundance allows us to, to produce enough oil in 2,000 to 5,000 gallons per acre per year to actually have a huge impact. Now, how do we grow algae? Well, we know how to grow algae. There are a number of businesses and industries already growing algae, and we grow it in two different ways. In the upper picture is a, basically a shallow channel. It's called a raceway or it's just a pond, and it has that paddle wheel, which looks like the old paddle wheels from these, the, the, um, the, steam, the boats that used to be these paddle boats that go up and down the Mississippi and such. That's one way, and the other way is using these so-called photobioreactors, which are basically enclosures. So we have two different ways that we grow algae. Do we know how to make oil from algae? We certainly do. We know how to take the algae that the oil produces, which is basically a vegetable oil, and we know the pathway that goes through cultivating the organisms to the oil production, to harvesting the algae, extracting, separating, processing, refining, and finally end up with fuels. We know that pathway. That's worked out. Can algae fulfill the needs that we described in saying we do not want to compete with agriculture? Can we do this? Can we not compete with agriculture for water and not compete with agriculture for fertilizer and land? And can we make this into something that would be feasible, affordable, scalable, and ultimately sustainable? And can we do this now with our current technologies? Well, let's consider water and fertilizer. Do we have a source of water and fertilizer that'll let us grow algae, which require quite a lot of water? And the answer is yes. If we look at the fact that algae can grow on our sewage, our wastewater, what goes down the drain, and if you look at the graph I'm showing you here, this chart shows you that between San Francisco and San Diego, we are producing on the order of 1.8 billion gallons of wastewater a day that goes pumped out into the ocean or into our bays. And algae would be perfectly happy growing in that wastewater. 1.8 billion gallons a day. Here you can notice San Jose and Santa Clara is 112 million gallons a day. Let's look at San Francisco. So if we're going to now envision that in order to get to a sustainable form of fuel, and we all can imagine all the reasons for that, where is the San Francisco well, wastewater? 
Well, here's one site. It's a place called the Southeast Plant. And if you look at the Southeast Plant, it's, pr it's processing about 65 million gallons a day. And if we try to envision how we're going to put um, one of those paddle wheel ponds or, one of, or, or some of those bioreactors, photobioreactors into that location, well, first thing we need to do is we have to, instead of pumping the waste out into the bay, we'd have to redirect it on land. Um, and if you calculate how much area we'd need in ponds, and the ponds were, say, 30 feet wide and one foot deep or so, they would, we need about 382 miles of, of these channels running back and forth. They would cover about 1,500 acres. Hmm. 1,500 acres along the peninsula is not an easy thing to imagine. <laughs> so let's say we're sort of stuck um, in terms of doing it locally. Um, but what about this? What about moving it into the bay? What about putting it offshore? What about putting it into San Francisco Bay? But we wouldn't be able to use an open pond, but could we use something like those photobioreactors but now in the bay, we'd use less than 1% of the bay. Now, here's the idea. Look, we make some kind of enclosure, and we put it underwater just below the surface, and we can make, put in the algae that we need to grow, and we fill it with the treated wastewater, and we would like to have the system sort of flexible, so we can use wave energy to stir its contents. All that's good. Um, the, the, the fact is that the algae use solar energy and they take CO2 that would otherwise go off into the atmosphere and do the things that we know CO2 does, which isn't so good. And they produce oxygen, which they release into the atmosphere. All good. The heat from the sun, which is a problem on land because these things become solar thermal collectors, is dissipated into the water. And we can actually use the salt water for other things. We produce fuel and cosmetics and fertilizer and animal food. And wow, this seems pretty good. Well, well there is the problem that we'd like to use lots of these things to grow enough fuel for us. And we use our waterways for other things. But look, we, we can envision how we would do this using channels and allowing ships to go by. I mean, it's not an impossible idea. So that's what Diane was talking about. Omega, offshore membrane enclosures for growing algae. What does this actually look like? I mean, follow the logic here. We imagine this thing that's a kind of floating bioreactor. We can make it out of plastic. We fill it with treated wastewater, and we have some source of CO2 that we include. The wastewater, which is fresh water, becomes nutrients for growing our algae, and the algae grow on solar energy. The heat capacity of the surrounding water controls the temperature inside the system, and waves provide energy for mixing. The algae that grow produce oxygen, and they use up CO2. We can use the salt gradient that exists between wastewater and the surrounding water to do forward osmosis, and furthermore, the salt content of the outside water kills the algae if they escape. In other words, if something happens to our system, something unexpected, for example, um, a bolt of lightning comes and makes a hole in the thing, well, it leaks wastewater into, the ocean, into that particular part of the ocean or bay that goes there anyway, and the algae are biodegradable. In fact, the algae themselves are filled with oils that are biodegradable, and the algae have protein and nucleic acid and such, all biodegradable, not a problem for the environment. And what doesn't get eaten is freshwater algae. It can't live in the salt water, so it dies. The plastic that we're going to make this out of is something that we have a lot of familiarity with, so we can fix it. We can patch the plastic and put the whole thing conceivably back together. Hmm. An idea worth spreading. So what are the benefits? The benefit is that we're now treating our wastewater, which we currently dump into these waterways, and grow wild algae, grow marine algae. Hmm, that's not very good. So now we're going to clean that water, both by having algae of our choice growing on that water, as well as producing clean water that's released by forward osmosis. We fix carbon dioxide that would otherwise end up in the atmosphere, and we produce biofuels. But we also produce fertilizer, because when the algae have got their oils extracted, what's left can be made into fertilizer or animal food or cosmetics or a lot of other products. The whole system creates a floating reef. It's really not so bad in terms of the environment, because the stuff that's going to grow on the bottom of this system, of this omega system, will be 
good for invertebrates and algae, macros, you know, sea seaweeds and such, and we'll get things like fish sticks, and it'll improve the environment. We could build it in the context of wind turbines that we're talking about putting offshore, and we could actually even use the waves to generate energy at the same time they're mixing our bioreactors. Ah, but you're thinking, my God, the ocean is so tough. How are we ever going to be able to do this? Well, there are bays, like San Francisco Bay and San Diego Bay and Chesapeake Bay. There's a lot of, of protected areas. But in addition to those types of protect, naturally protected areas, we're pretty good at building structures like breakwaters and such things. Oh, and then, of course, there's the sea level rise which is going to give us all kinds of potential opportunities to use, <laughs> to use this um, encroachment on, on shallow or, or low-lying land um, as a basis for designing our energy system and our wastewater treatment systems. So what are the challenges? Well, come on, let's be honest. I'm a scientist. There are going to be significant challenges to make this work in biology and engineering and economics and, and environmental challenges, both because we don't want to damage the environment, we don't want to totally shade out things in the environment, but, but also there are, there are social issues like permitting and, and how do we get you know, NIMBY issues, like not in my backyard or in this case not in my bay. Are we up to the task? Are we up to the task? We, the people who figured out how to split the atom. We, the people that put people on the moon to take that picture that we saw. So let me close with a few remarks about where we stand in the context of this image that I showed you to start with. We are perhaps on one of the most important thresholds in the history of humanity. We stand on the threshold between being hunters and gatherers of our energy and becoming sustainable cultivators of some form of environmentally friendly energy. And it won't be a single source. It'll be multiple solutions. Thank you.